All right, Amos chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. My context is going to be uh, faith, is, faith and justice talks on the UIC campus. So basically, what, what do faith and justice have to do with each other? Do they have anything to do with each other? What does that look like in kind of the modern world? Um, I thought about doing, like, is there any place for evangelism in faith? And then I was like, oh, that might be... I might be a little too spicy. I'm not sure if I can pull that off. So, yeah, faith and justice. Oh, do we have a clock? Uh, That's going to be... It said, oh, okay. You do you wanna, I just want to be able to see it. Yeah, just because, like I said, like I'm not sure on the timing on this one. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> But, I mean, it's, it's, if it's going to be a big pain, it's okay. I mean, have the clock right there on the wall. That'll be good practice, too. Yeah, a 10 and a 5 might be helpful. Okay. You just kind of hold up your... Sweet. I saw the earlier classes had to do it. The old... Then cut. I know, I like, I should practice like either my watch or like a clock on the wall, like using that to sort of gauge time. Um, so it'll be good practice. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for having me here at these Faith and Justice Talks on campus. It has been a joy to think together about the need in our world for justice. It's been a joy to think with other people who care about people in this world. I think if we're honest, it's a difficult question because religion has been a source of oppression well, pretty much ever since religion has been a thing, has it not? Even right now in our own world, there are the Rohingya Muslims being persecuted in Myanmar for their beliefs. The, the Uyghur Muslims are oppressed and enslaved in China because of their beliefs, because they are a minority in a majority culture. If religion has been a source of oppression for so long, I think we can begin to wonder, is there really any place for faith and justice? And I say this as a, as a Christian, as a Christian who believes in a God and in a religion that, if we're honest, has been at the center of this issue for a long time. Christianity, I will be the first to admit, and Lord willing, the loudest voice on, has been misused as a means of oppressing and hurting other people. From the Crusades in which um, armies used religion to justify the destruction and, and uh, theft of other people's lands, to even more recently here on this continent for hundreds of years, Christians, American Christians, used their religion to justify the stealing and oppression and enslavement of other people, of human beings. If that's the case, what place do faith and justice have together? Is there really any hope for religion and justice to coincide? Or should we abandon religion altogether as a means of oppression? Friends, while it is true that faith and justice have been opposed for a long time, that often religion has been used as a means of hurting and enslaving other people. Today, I want to look at God's response to that. If God is real after all, I want to pose to you today that God's word is our only hope for justice. If God is real and worth believing in, then he must also be a God that cares about justice. And his word must also have something to say about that justice. I believe that the God of the Bible is the true God, and if he really is, then his word will have something to say about justice. So let's see together what the Bible has to say about this, whether or not maybe that is a God worth believing in, or if, after all, Christianity is only a means of oppression and injustice. I've printed out for you a page from a book of the Bible, from Amos, it's chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. The large number is the chapter number, the smaller numbers are the verse numbers. I would encourage you to follow along and check to see if what I'm saying actually matches up with what the Bible is saying. To give you a little context, Amos was a prophet to the nation of Israel, God's 
people. That's what you need to know about Israel. Now, Israel uh, had been using their religion, their belief in God, to justify oppression, to ju justify injustice. And the book of Amos is God's response to that injustice. Let's read together. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there is no trap for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? God's word, if God really is real, is our only hope for justice. I think this passage breaks down into two pieces. First, we are going to look at that justice. What justice does God actually promise? This word is spoken to the people of Israel. The primary identification of the people of Israel, what makes the people of Israel the people of God, is that they were rescued by God. Look there in, in verse 1. God says, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. In verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the, the earth. The people of Israel were God's people. They were in special relationship with God. They were rescued by God. Therefore, they, they should have lived out a life of justice, a life of goodness. If they really were following a good God, shouldn't they also have lived out a good life, a just life? This is the great evil of the people of Israel. This is God's problem with the people of Israel here. He rescued them from slavery and now they have turned and enslaved others. He, he, he brought them into a good life to enjoy it and instead they have oppressed others to bring pleasure to themselves. The evil of people of God in this verse is that they have failed to live in light of who they are as a people, of their relationship with God. Maybe this is what you don't like about Christians. Maybe this is what you hate about Christianity. People who claim to be the people of God, people who claim to be sinners saved by grace, rescued by God, that Jesus died for them, yet who can't spare a thought for anyone else. People who, who claim to be following a good God, and yet their lives don't look anything like it. Friends, I can say this to you now. The Bible is on your side. God is on your side. God, too, hates when people use religion to justify oppression, when people use their relationship with God to justify and excuse their evil behavior. The word that God has spoken against the people of Israel, the people of God, is a word spoken against injustice. Because of his relationship with his people, he will punish them. See, the message of the Bible might be different than the message of the Christians that you see on TV. The message of God might actually be one of justice, even if it doesn't look like it in our current American Christian moment. Israel's failure to live this out actually only highlights the call, actually only highlights the need to live out a good life. Their failure is not an indictment of God, but an indictment of themselves. Where they ought to have lived a good life, where they ought to have lived a life of gratitude, of rescued people, loving others, living in justice, they didn't. And yet, don't you and I want to live that life? Wouldn't it be good if we could live a life of justice and love towards others? Friends, this is, not, this is the message of Christianity, the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is not join this political party, hold these beliefs, give to this church. The message of the Bible is to be rescued into 
the relationship with God, into the, the way that you were supposed to live. The good news in the face of injustice in our world, good news in the face of religious injustice, is that God is absolutely committed to justice. There is no partiality or favoritism with God. There is no way to escape God's justice just by claiming that you're the people of God, that you have his special favor. No, even the people of Israel would be judged for the way that they had treated others poorly. And if you're anything like me, I want to see justice lived out in this world. I I want to see this world be a place of fairness, of goodness, of peace. Where can we find that in this world? Who could we possibly look to for that? When it seems that all of our leaders are more concerned about pleasing their constituents than they are about goodness and justice. It seems that those in power would rather stay in power than actually deal with the problems of this world, than actually give themselves sacrificially to solving what needs to be solved. Where can we possibly find injustice in this world? If this God is actually real, wouldn't he be a good God? Wouldn't he be someone worth following? Someone so committed to justice, so committed to righting the wrongs of the world that we live in, that not only, not even his people are safe. Not even people who claim his name are going to escape that judgment. That sounds like a God worth believing in. Friends, it breaks my heart to hear the news of Russia invading Ukraine to think of the countless innocent people who are losing their lives in one of the most unjust acts in recent history. It breaks my heart to think about the Uyghur people enslaved and oppressed in China, and it feels like nobody cares. Nobody in power is actually going to do anything about it, even though we all know it's happening. Where can we look for justice? The Bible promises a greater justice which sounds good, but how can we possibly trust that? How can we possibly trust that God is actually going to bring any sort of measure of justice? Well, we have seen what that justice looks like, and now we turn to how we know that that justice will happen. God's word, after all, is our only hope for justice if God is really God. So let's look at that word. Verse 3 begins this series of sort of odd rhetorical questions. Do two walk together unless they've agreed to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? As I read through that, you might have been wondering, what is Amos doing? All right, we get it. The word of the Lord is going against the people of Israel. Judgment is coming. Sounds great. What's going on with all these questions? Amos is trying to declare the certainty of coming judgment. How can we be sure that judgment is coming? God's word guarantees that judgment. God's word guarantees that justice will happen. If God really is God, then wouldn't his word be a guarantee? If God is actually God, able to do all things, wouldn't the word that he speaks come about? That's what these people need because they're not just wicked people. The people of Israel weren't just enslavers and oppressors. They were also people who used their religion to justify that and excuse it. They were people who were sure that they were right with God. A people who were sure that God was happy with them. Because of their religious practices, because of their good deeds. These weren't just a wicked people, they were also a blind people. What a dangerous place to be to be convinced that God is happy with you. How would we know? How would we know if God was actually pleased with us? How would we know if judgment was really coming? God's word is a guarantee of God's justice. Because if God is really God, then what he says will come about. 
That's what these questions are doing. They're drawing on a simple rule of nature, cause and effect. Things don't happen randomly. Lions don't roar in the forest when they don't have any prey. Birds don't fall in a snare. Birds don't fall in a snare to the earth when there is no snare set for them. There is always a cause and effect in this universe. So wouldn't that be the case with God? Amos is basically saying to the people, look, hey, I don't want to bring this message. This isn't my favorite sermon to bring. It's not my favorite sermon to preach. I didn't come up with this one. God gave it to me, and if God gave it to me, how can I not preach it? At the end of those questions, he declares, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? When God speaks, Amos has to prophesy. In fact, the, the very fact that Amos is speaking to the people should alert them that this reality is coming. God's word is a guarantee of the coming justice. Which is good news. Because if justice, if God has declared that justice is coming, then it is coming. Our only hope for justice in this life is something outside of ourselves, isn't it? I mean, look at the world. This is the fruit of our labor to fix our problems. Again, I would ask, isn't this a God worth believing in? Doesn't this seem like a good God? A God who has declared that justice is coming. A God who is committed to carrying out justice. A God that you can trust. A God that you can be sure will actually do what he says because he is God. But it leaves us with one question. What about us? What about you and me? Because if God is really as committed to justice as he says he is, to the point where not even the people of Israel, God's chosen people, will escape that judgment, and if that judgment is surely coming because God has declared it and he is God, then where can you and I find safety? Where can you and I find hope if not even the people of God had a hope of escaping that judgment? Because if we're honest, our political leaders and warring nations are not necessarily the exception. Yet maybe you and I are not as bad as we could be. And yet, when it really comes down to it, when we have the opportunity to get ahead, when we have the opportunity to put someone else down, make ourselves feel better, to get that promotion. Uh, aren't we quick to jump at that chance? Really, the only difference between us and those who are committing atrocities on a global scale is reach and ability, right? If we had the opportunity to rule the world, would it look that much different? Or would we just be at the top of the same pyramid? Where is the hope for us? Thankfully, God's word is not just a guarantee of justice, but it is also grace in the face of that justice. It is our only hope for justice, not only because it declares that justice is coming surely, but because it also gives us a way out. See, the goal of God's word through Amos is not sadistic. God actually sent Amos, right? He didn't just send judgment. And he didn't just send Amos to like laugh at the people like, you're screwed, whatever, you know. No, God sent Amos with a purpose so that the people would see how messed up they were and would turn back to their God. He's reminding them of who they are. You are the people of Israel the people that I rescued, the, the people that I knew, turn back. There is an opportunity implicit here to turn back to God and be rescued from judgment. God's word is a guarantee of justice, of judgment, but it is also grace in the face of that justice, an opportunity 
to turn to God and be rescued. The people of Israel didn't take that opportunity. The people of Israel didn't turn back to God. They were sure that because of their religious practices, because of their good deeds, that they'd be okay. And it was only a few decades later that they were sent into exile. What about you? Yeah, we're not the people of Israel. You might not even believe in this God. But as you hear the word of God, you too have to choose how you're going to respond. Will you trust in the only one who can actually guarantee justice in this world, the only one who is powerful enough, the only one who is good enough to carry out justice to the point where no one is favored or partial to that judgment? and yet also the only one who can rescue you from that judgment. Friends, I can promise you justice is coming. God will carry out the judgment that he promised. How do I, how do I know that? Because it already arrived. In the person of, of Jesus Christ. This is what makes Christianity different from every other religion. That message is pretty much the same as every religion. God or God's, or some being is going to make things better. You just have to follow these steps. You just have to be a better person. But the message of Christianity is that you can't be a better person. We are all more or less like the people of Israel, using whatever we can to justify our own oppression. You only need to look at the larger world to see proof of that. But Jesus Christ arrived and lived the life that you and I couldn't live. The life of justice, a life of love and goodness towards others. And yet in the most unju unjust act in the world, he was put to death. But he didn't just die. Three days later, Jesus would get up from the dead, would ascend into heaven as God and king over all and would then make the same proclamation that Amos does here. Hear this word. Not now just to the people of Israel, but to all people, because Jesus reigns over all. Jesus created all people. And so demands a response. Will you hear the word of the Lord? Will you turn to God? I want to be clear, I'm not inviting you to grab your ticket into heaven. I'm not in inviting you to uh, get out of jail free card. What I'm inviting you is to be rescued back into the life that you were meant to live. To be rescued back into a life of justice, a life of love and good towards others. Because you're rescued back into relationship with the God who made you. If God really is God, if the God of the Bible really is God and made all things then our only hope for justice is his word. Our only hope for justice is relationship with him, which can be only be found as we hear his word, as we respond to that word, recognizing that we have failed to carry out justice, but looking to the one who succeeded. Friends, if you want to talk to this, talk to me about this, want to tell me I'm wrong, if you have questions, I would love nothing more than to talk to you afterwards. I'd love to read through the book of Amos with you. But whatever you do, I beg you to respond to the word of God. One way or another, you have heard God's word, and now you must respond. Will you turn back to the God who made you? Live the way that you were meant to live, a life of justice? Or will you, like the people of Israel, Ignore God's word and declare yourselves okay. Even while everything around you, everything in our world, everything in our lives says otherwise. Thank you.